um, Professor Dunfield. Uh, I'm privileged and uh, very proud to be invited here uh, to, say, to, to give a lecture to this uh, honorable session. Um, I hope that uh, you enjoy my presentation. I'm going to speak about the uh, adjuvant therapy in IVF. Uh, as you know, the crosstalk between embryo and endometrium leading to implantation is a complex and highly controlled phenomena. And over the last decade, a large amount of clinical research has been carried out in an attempt to increase the likelihood of pregnancy in IVF. Repeated implantation failure have negative impact of quali on quality of life. Each failed cycle incurs suspension financial costs as well. So what is the definition of adjuvant therapy? Adjuvant therapy is any empiric of, or evidence-based medicine drug treatment or procedure that is not directly related to routine treatment in a patient. And you see here the tarot cards. I put it here because a lot of things and a lot of attitudes in adjuvant therapy belongs to the intuition to the insight and to the experience of the doctor, and we cannot be dogmatic about adjuvant therapy. So is the use of adjuvant therapy improving the outcome of IVM? Is it possible that it may be particularly beneficial for women with repeated IVF failures? In Israel, we have a lot of women with repeated IVF failures, and you know why? Because the treatment is free of charge, illimited. So the purpose of this presentation is to review the literature on the effective, uh, effectiveness of adjuvant therapy in IVF and to provide the fertility professionals like you with evidence-based guidance as much as possible on the treatment. So I put here the Gauss curve because, as you know, all biological phenomena, uh, they behave in a Gauss manner. But now we are going to speak about we are going to speak about something which is not in the center, something which is more rare, and the research, therefore, is very difficult to perform, because most of the women, they get pregnant after three or four cycles of IVF, but then what do we do when she has had 10 cycles or nine cycles or eight cycles of IVF? I don't know if you see a lot of women like that. So what is evidence-based medicine and meta-analysis in our case that we are speaking about really the age, the end of the growth curve? You know, somebody told me that meta-analysis to medicine is like metaphysics to physics. I mean, multivariate meta-analysis modeling is modeling the heterogeneity because this small group is very heterogeneous and very difficult. It's a difficult patient to treat. So are we mixing apples and oranges? Is it dangerous? Is it delicious? We will see. We start the journey now. So adjuvant therapies have divided into three parts, fetal factors, maternal factors, and other factors. So in the fetal factors, we have two main approaches. One is the assisted hatching, and one is the brain plantation genetic diagnosis. So what about assisted hatching? You know, artificially disrupting the zona is known as assisted hatching, and there is some evidence that embryos that have undergone zona manipulation for assisted hatching tend to implant one day earlier than an unhatched embryo. And w w what is the philosophy behind? The philosophy is that the exposure of the oocyte and embryos to the artificial conditions have negative effect on the embryo ability to hatch and this results in low implantation rate. So th there have been a variety of techniques to assist the embryo hatching, drilling, dissection, thinning, using of acids, lasers, proteinas, and vibrators. However, it has been then clinically useful only in a subgroup. Even people that are favoring assisted hatching, they say it should be used in repeated failed IVF cycle, poor embryo quality, and women after the age of 37. But 
a review of the Cochrane database, 2005 and 2009, uh, concluded that evidence to support the clinical use of assisted hatching in the context of implantation fa failure is insufficient. Am I going to do assisted hatching in a patient that failed 10 times? Yes, at least to part of her embryos, because at this stage we are desperate to help her. And she might or not might belong to, to the successful group, but it is a viable procedure. What about PGS or PGD? As you know, when we are karyotyping embryos in couples with implantation failure, 66% may be chromosomal, chromosomal abnormal. Why? Because prolonged culture uh, may cause it. And when we uh, take embryos, uh, unrepeated embryos, only 20% they will go to blastocyst. And they arrest before cavitation. So maybe we should diagnose them before we transplant them. So pre PGS screening was, uh, was advocated in aged women, in repeated miscarriage, in severe male factor, and in repeated IVF failures. But there are drawbacks to the PGS. Initially, in 2002-03, we thought that every woman will have PGS before transplanting embryos to the womb. Why not? Why not transferring good embryos? However, many zygotes do not survive the biopsy. And with the fish and PCR, uh, only five to nine chromosomes uh, are assessed. Uh, we have now the technique of 24 chromosomes. However, it's very expensive, it's time consuming, and it is still experimental. Another aspect is that any single cell may differ genetically from another cell. We have the mosaicism. And the most amazing thing is that after PGS, some embryos that may have developed into normal fetuses are not selected for transfer because we do a PGS, we see an abnormal cell, but the rest of the cells are normal. So another aspect is that two groups have shown in 2008 that uh, after PGS, there is a low implantation and pregnancy rate. And so this technique is questionable. A recent systematic review of PGS in assisted reproduction concluded that there is insufficient data to determine whether PGS is an effective treatment in implantation failure. And uh, there was a position statement from the ASHREP PGD Consortium Steering Committee, which included 11 RCTs, mainly in for advanced maternal age, and they didn't find any evidence that it is efficient in patients with uh, advanced maternal age, and uh, we need more studies about the efficiency of PGS in failed IVF. And I can tell you from personal communication, most of the patients that come to the five, six, seven failed cycles, they don't have eight eggs. They don't have 10 eggs. Some of them are poor responders. And in PGS, if you don't have eight eggs, even those uh, people that think that it, you must do it and it's very good, uh, they know that uh, you need at least eight good um, eggs to be able to choose an embryo for transfer after PGS. So what about maternal factors? You see, I've put here a list of maternal factors, and uh, we will discuss each one shortly. Aspirin.